Hi, Lori. Welcome to the Women Waken podcast. Hi, Whitney. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. So nice to see you in, well, virtually in person. And you are in your home in the city in San Francisco, right? Yes, I am. On a beautiful day. Oh, it's sunny? It's sunny. Yeah. What a treat for San Francisco. Yeah. (laughs) We like it when it's sunny. Yeah. So Lori, you and I connected um, towards the end of last year. And I have to tell you, it was, it felt very serendipitous. Um, Mm. I had been thinking a lot about the new year, about things I wanted to work on and what I was really wanting to focus on. And one of those is doing more speaking engagements, doing more things where I share my voice and my thoughts. You know, this podcast was a big step for me. Um, I am a mental health therapist by trade professionally. Yet, you know, my greater passion is to discuss and share concepts and ideas that I believe are very important and pivotal to our evolution in the future to create a a better, um, healthier world and life experience for humans. (laughs) And, um, you know, that can be a bit daunting to start putting yourself out there because, you know, the more you have a presence, the more susceptible you are to you know, feedback, especially nowadays when, you know, you go online and you can have hundreds of people looking at you and there's lots of different avenues and platforms to speak. So I was just thinking a lot about it and wondering, you know, how am I going to find the courage to do that? If I, if that's really what I want, why am I waiting? What's holding me back? And I literally the next morning had an email from you that said, Hey, I saw your podcast and I like what you talk about. And I help people find their voice and use their voice and become, you know, speakers and leaders and visionaries. And I was like, Oh my gosh, those are like my three main things for this. <laughs> so it was really cool. And we connected and we had a great chat and now I get to have you on the show. Yay. I love synchronicity like that. Me too. Uh, it feels like you, you drew us together. I like to think so. Yeah. Yeah. Brought in that energy manifest. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Lori, why don't you tell us about what, what it is that you do? What is your work and sort of what is your, your current situation in far, as far as who do you work with? What's your focus? What are you all about? Yeah. I am a public speaking and leadership coach. I love to work with visionaries who are speaking and leading and showing up and being seen for the sake of some cause that is larger than all of us. Uh, Some of whom would not want to be seen or to speak in public if it were not for the sake of that cause. They're sort of someone who has been a leader from behind or might not even consider themselves a leader. Uh, And all of them are speaking for the sake of helping to do their part to make their world or the world a better place. And I love to help them come alive from head to toe and step into their fullest expression, which I've learned along the way really, really requires that we allow ourselves to be seen in order to be heard and felt and to have the impact that we want to have in the world. Absolutely. Well, that's fantastic work and very important work that you do. And now do you see clients in person? Do you have like your own studio or or have you come to do a lot of your work virtually? Uh, I do all of my work now virtually. And I like to say to people I've, I've, been on Zoom since before it was fashionable, Uh, (laughs) uh, before COVID-19. I used to and probably will again occasionally see people in person so that we can work up on our feet in a theater space with the red chairs looking at you, symbolizing the audience looking at you. And I started shifting to platforms like Zoom and eventually Zoom became my favorite so that I could work with the visionaries all over the world that I really felt an alignment and a kinship and a synchronicity with. And what is it exactly, what is the look, what does it look like? What is the work that you do with them? You know, when someone approaches you and they say, listen, I've 
been thinking a lot about, you know, my, my message and my vision. I just don't know what to do with it or how to speak it and feel that, you know, and I think I imagine what you would see is a lot of, you know, self doubt and a, a lack of ability to believe that it's important for what we have to say to be spoken and heard. Yeah. Some people, the, almost everybody comes to me with some sort of discomfort or frustration or hang up around really putting their voice out there or they're putting it out there and they have a sense that there's something more available in how it's going. Like they, they want to be clear and to be understood and they want something more. They want to be a transformational speaker or an inspirational speaker. And they might feel like they're not being heard or like their message isn't landing. And the way that I work is much more about how we embody what we say and getting the static that blocks the fullness of our expression out of the way. The vast majority of people that I work with when it comes to public speaking, I now work with in small groups. Um, I have a, a program that's a small group that everybody goes through together. And then I also have a community and most of the people in the community are graduates of that other program. And then the, the other set of people that I work with is where they really have stepped into, oh, I am a visionary leader or I aim to be a visionary leader who sees something that I would like to be different in the world. And uh, they may or may not still want help with their public speaking. And the work shifts to uh, leadership coaching where I'm their ally. I'm a mirror for them to bounce things off of. And I'll ask powerful questions of them and blurt truths that I'm seeing or intuitions that I have. And that half of my work is really more about making their vision real in the world through navigating their life on a day-to-day -day basis. And what are, what are these people doing? You know, when we talk about being uh, a leader or a visionary and sharing a message, what are, is it, are these people, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is maybe like a TED talk, or, you know, we think that that's like the only, but it, there's so many different outlets. So what are a lot of people you work with, what kind of sort of speaking engagements are they doing? Yeah, some are doing in-person events like TED talks, if they're not doing TED talks themselves. Uh, over the course of the past few years, in particular, a lot of people are doing podcasts and going to virtual conferences, to virtual events, virtual conferences, virtual gatherings to share their message and their medicine with the world. Some people are shooting videos where I do it myself a lot now as well, shooting a video live and just sharing a tidbit of wisdom or shooting videos for their website. So there's a huge range that has emerged over the past few years. I, I think COVID in some ways called some of the reluctant leaders or reluctant visual, visionaries. It was like a huge wake up call for all of us, myself included. And it kind of called a lot of people forward to find a way to get their voice out there in the way that makes sense for them. So there's a much greater range that I'm working with now than I was three or four years ago. Yeah. Wow. That must've been interesting to watch that shift happen. Cause it sounds like you were already doing all this and doing online stuff before. Unlike most of us who had to kind of really shift our business and our focus and work, you were already there, but then you saw, you sort of start sort of saw other people changing and coming to you so then you already had set up shop so that sounds really convenient <laughs> yeah I felt I felt very grateful in the beginning um I I know a lot of coaches some public speaking and some executive coaches and health coaches and some of my friends and colleagues had a really rough first couple of months because they were and speakers too had a really rough first couple of months when COVID really kind of shut down the world because they were used to in-person and, and had to shift and learn 
how to do it via Zoom. And I remember there was a, a wave of resistance. I would hear about speakers who were having engagements canceled or were postponing it until this is over, thinking, oh, we're going to do our conference in three weeks and we're going to do it in person. And they would cancel and then sometimes come back to the speakers a couple months later when it really sank in. Like, if you want to do it soon, you're going to need to shift and find a way to deliver it online because we, we didn't know, especially then, when would it even be possible to be back in the same room? So you either have to shut down completely or shift gears. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So where did this all begin for you, Lori? Where did this journey begin towards the work, you know, the life that you have now, the work that you're doing, your, I would, it sounds like your life's purpose. You kind of followed your life's calling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not knowing it as many of us don't at all the points along the way. Um, I think it started when I was, well, really the thought that popped to my head is it started before I ever came here. Um, can you tell us about that? <laughs> uh, I feel like I, I've heard people talk about this, so I'm not, I'm not originating this thought that my soul chose the journey that it's having in this lifetime. So before I came here, I knew that I was going to come down here and do something with raising consciousness through voice, with helping people to be seen. And of course, that has meant that it's been a journey of learning to allow myself to be seen and heard and felt and to believe that my own voice matters. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the journey here in this body, in this life feels like I can trace it back to when I was about five years old. Um, I'm intensely creative <laughs> and I love stories. And my mother found me in our backyard with my hair pinned up in little pin curls. Uh, and I was pretending to be Cindy Brady from a TV show at the time called The Brady Bunch. And I was enacting it in our backyard by myself. And my mother went, uh-huh. And she started looking for an acting class to take me to. And I went to the world of theater, which like everything has a light side and a dark side. And the light side of theater is a place where I felt like I'd found my tribe of weirdos. Um, I felt like I belonged. I felt like people in the world of theater were able to be present and connected in a deeper way than most of the rest of the planet was. And, you know, this started as early as even seven years old. I would not have been able to name it at five to seven years old, but looking back now, it was a through line. And fast forward to me having a day job uh, after graduating undergrad. I was working as an executive assistant during the day to support my acting habit, basically, and doing theater at night. And I was taking an acting class with my favorite acting instructor. His name is Richard Side, And he would do improv work with people, not the improv that we're used to seeing on Saturday Night Live, uh, more realistic, I guess, would be a way to put it. Like, it's not about being funny. It was about exploring just different aspects of ourselves. And he did an exercise with me in that class where the whole class was focused on me. It was called a short stack. And they kept coming in with different improv scenarios. And he noticed that I kept doing all the stuff that we as humans do like suppressing my breathing and, you know, if I was crying in one scene or laughing hysterically, trying to like suppress it all and start from I'm fine in between the scenes. And he paused, which over, it's funny to me because he had to pause so often with me over the years to kind of give me a clue of what the exercise was designed to do. 
And he said, you keep pulling yourself together in between the scenes. Don't do that. Just wherever you are, go from what is true, what is present for you. And I said, I'm not that comfortable having everyone looking at me. And he said, well, then you've picked a strange set of careers for yourself. You're an actor, a teacher, and a speaker. Those are all things where people are looking at you. Part of you wants this. Part of you knows you're meant to be here. And I knew he was right. It was like speaking straight through all of my resistance to my soul. And I trusted him. So I continued the exercise and just kept opening, you know, open, be where I am. Don't try to suppress it and be fine. And I felt like layers of resistance were melting away. And when that exercise was finished, I looked out at everyone and I felt like I could see and feel what kind of emotional state every single person in the room was in. And now I call it one of my first moments of oneness, a moment of oneness that continued beyond when I was acting. Um, I'd had moments of oneness when I was a character. I'd had moments of oneness in sports where you're kind of in a state of flow. And in that moment, I was done acting. And I stayed in this eerie, beautiful state of oneness. And um, it was all about allowing myself to really be seen. That's why I could see them that fully when it was over was partially because it's kind of a two-way street. If I allow you to see me, then I can see you more deeply. And it's so tempting as people who want to be of service to just want to see the other person. <laughs> I want to see you, I want to hold space for you, but can I do that without you seeing me? Yeah. So then, so that brought you to, you know, your experience. And then when did you realize that it was something you wanted to turn into a profession? Mm. I had an experience in, in college playing a goddess character in the Scottish play uh, where I had to find my voice in a theater mask. And we got the mask really late in the process, like a couple of days before opening. And the director said, you know, you can just go out there and kind of move around the stage if you don't feel comfortable speaking yet. And I felt like I either need to do this in front of the 40 people that are here because they're in the cast or they're part of the technical crew, or I'm gonna be doing it on opening night. So I went ahead and just kind of started making these really primal sounds and through the course of this long slow motion scene found that character's voice and had some you know guides and helpers along the way who said I think you might want to go to this leadership program maybe you want to step into being a speaking coach or a voice coach in the theater and sometimes resisted and then eventually said yes to the call and I was in a leadership program and kind of my final piece of learning was resisting what is, is different than accepting what is while also moving forward to create change. And I came away going, well, that's what leadership is. I am present in the moment and I have a vision and I'm kind of sitting in this creative tension between the present moment and the future that I want for the planet. And at this time I was still mostly teaching theater students. And I had a back-to-back -back set of theater experiences, one where everyone in the class was very resistant and I was not teaching my style authentically or my way. And then the following year, all of the students that had been in the class the year before were told to repeat along with a whole batch of new students. And I started really doing it my way. 
Uh, and at the end of that quarter, I was watching the students warming up to act. And they looked like what I want for the planet, which was they were vibrant and alive from head to toe. They were supportive of each other. It was all the light side of the theater and none of the dark competitive side of the theater. And I was sitting in the corner with tears rolling down my face. And I remember thinking, I want more. And then my next thought was, this can't just be for actors anymore. And I kind of put all of my experiences together and thought, I'm gonna go work with leaders and visionaries. That way it can kind of ripple down to the whole planet. And really at that point went all in on my business, which is now called Voice Matters, supporting the visionaries and the leaders to be seen themselves in order to help change the world with their own creative creativity and their magic that they're bringing. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest shift that has to happen with somebody who goes from that person that you once were, and I think most people are, when they're feeling that they just kind of want to, you know, maybe you can act, like you said, you can express yourself sometimes when it comes to, you know, the in-betweens, like when you're moving from like an expression to, you know, the next thing and like what you're, the message you're trying to get across to wanting to kind of hide again. You know, it's one thing to sort of step out of the shadow and like say your piece, but to really be seen, it's, it's more than that, right? It's like a whole expression that's wanting to come out. So what is the shift that happens when someone, cause what you said was, was really powerful when you said it's about being in the present moment, but also at like honoring that and knowing that's of the greatest importance, but then also speaking to the future that you envision. And that to me, it, it takes being able to see the bigger picture and knowing that it's not, I like the term when we talk about our small self and our bigger self, right? Our, our ego self kind of, and like our wise mind, if you, you know, want to get into like DBT's type therapy talk. Yeah. It's so hard to pick one. <laughs> and the, the first thing that popped into my head was breath. Um, we are actually raised in a world that is modeling and often asking us to hide by suppressing our breathing. We're born as babies breathing full, luxurious, nourishing breaths. And uh, if you've ever been a house in a house with a baby who's teething and they're expressing what is going on for them, you can feel your hair standing up on end on the other side of the house. It is so resonant and there's nothing muddying the message. And then somebody says to us, don't be too big, don't be too much. Children should be seen and not heard. And the one that just about everybody gets consciously or unconsciously is don't be too emotional. I haven't met anybody who hasn't gotten some message of you're too emo emotional or don't be too emotional. And the way we suppress the emotions is by suppressing our breathing. And then it's like, we're not really processing our lives. So how could we express ourselves fully if we have not enough breath? If we're not allowing the resonance of our voice to come across, how can we be in the present moment if we're not really breathing nourishing breaths? And breathing almost feels like it's part of what helps us to be present and be moving forward in time at the same time. As long as, like you said, somewhere in the background or in the foreground, we know what that bigger vision is. And I think it makes it more comfortable to, to breathe and to be seen and be heard and be felt. It's so vulnerable and sometimes can feel like chaos. And if we know it's for the sake of, insert your vision here, it's still challenging, it's still courageous. And with the visionaries that I work with, it becomes a level easier when we are connected to that bigger picture. 
I think it's because like you said, it, it helps draw, draw the wise self to be the one that's in the driver's seat. Yeah. Yeah. And not the smaller ego self that says, oh gosh, what are people going to think? What are, is this okay? I think that's a, a common thing. And I know that I struggle with a lot is, is it okay? Is it okay to say this? Is it okay to put this out there? Cause I, once I put it out there, I can't take it back. And yeah, trusting that, you know, that who the message is meant for will receive it. You know, I find that to be more and more the case, you know, we can't resonate with every person that we work with, but those who we're meant to come together with synchronistically yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they'll hear you, you know, they'll hear what you have to say. And I think that's such a big leap of faith that any successful leader had to take was, you know, there's no way to get hundred percent approval rating or to connect hundred percent with everybody. I just have to do what I believe, what I feel inside me is my message, is my vision and step forward with that. But it's that step that is a big one. It's a doozy because it's walk, it's stepping away from that comfort zone of, well, if I just stay in the shadow, I'm not taking any risks. I'm not yeah. going to have those people who might criticize me, you know, but I look around all the time and I say, wow, you know, if, if I really admire this person, I love what they have to say. I'm so glad that they speak. But if they were worried about what people said about them, they would be hiding still, but they're not. And yeah. that gets me because I think, man, you know, you just, sometimes you just got to go for what you feel, what you, because as you said, a big part, I think also stepping into your leadership is tapping into your emotions, letting those emotions come up. Um, I've heard before that your emotions are and feelings is your soul talking to you and talking, you know, the soul doesn't talk, but it's, that's how it connects with you, communicates with you. So when we, we stifle emotions, which to your point, most of us do, we've mm -hmm. learned to do that. We've been told to do that. Like, oh, just get over it. Don't, you know, don't get emotional, calm down. Then we're pushing away what is our, you know, our true nature, our true selves. Yeah. Yeah. And that saying what you resist persists it uh, i am not very good at suppressing it uh, i can try and it's like but it's still there it's it's still coming back up because it wants to go somewhere it wants to become with the breath like the air conditioner that can shift the energy in a room and if we try to suppress it then that energy can't go out and shift the energy of a crowd or shift the vibe in a room. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So then back to, you know, speaking of bringing the breath, which, you know, breath is the essence of life. It's, you know, it's, it's, so it is the most important thing, but again, another thing that we just, you know, we don't give much mind to, we take it for granted, like everything else. We're like, Oh, I just breathe. And it's, but until if anyone's had any sort of respiratory issues or any sort of lung issues where you, your breath is compromised, then you really recognize, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's really scary to have that, you know, not functioning well. And you recognize the power and the, the beauty of, of our breath. Yeah. So to get people in touch with it or to help people to recognize just how important it is, are there certain exercises that you do or that you could offer our listeners like easy ones or something, you know, just sort of a beginner's guide to breath? I do. Uh, let's see how easy. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of different versions. Um, so one of the ones I'll give like a slight shift to put it in three parts is inhaling through the nose and then exhaling on an S extended like a leaky tire. And I could go even longer, but for the sake of time, do that for 30 to 45 seconds and then inhale through the nose and exhale on a Z sound. And then for another 45 seconds and then start inhaling through the mouth and exhaling on a Z. It helps to remind the body of what we knew as babies, which was inhale air and make sound. And it's like rewatering seeds that are already there. It's, I give my clients some version of that and we'll often ask them to do that for a total of two minutes a day or more if you're loving it and you wanna keep going. Two minutes a day for seven days in a row and notice what shifts. And that's everything from people who have been called quieter who are at an oblong table and 
are used to speaking and the people on the other end can't hear them. That might be because they're trying to sort of muscle their voice over there instead of letting the air do more of the work. Some people feel more energized because of all that, you know, they warmed up in the morning and then their breath is flowing all day and it just feels like everything is easier because they're not muscling their way through their day. They're kind of riding the soul's energy and riding the breath through their day. It doesn't mean they're not doing anything. It just means there's some more air and nourishment there to support them. Yeah. And so when you speak about, you know, sort of how they um, sort of project or use their voice, how much of your work is about, because also, you know, speaking is projecting. It's, it's how do you, you know, get your voice out to an audience? How do you conduct your voice when you're speaking to a large group? And even though we do it mostly online right now, but even on online or in a, you know, a big auditorium, you're still, there's a lot to like your diaphragm work and all of that that goes into theater, right? Anybody who's been, you know, a live theater actor has to practice that. It's your tool, right? It's your, yeah. your voice is your tool. You're, you have to figure out all the components, how to, you know, really work with it and hone it just like you would an instrument. It is an instrument, right? It is. We, we are our own instruments, our bodies, our breath, our minds, our soul. And I do a lot of work with the breath and bring in voice from the theater and yoga. I work a lot with the body, the breath and the energy to get that aligned with that intention or that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, breath and then part of being seen and resonating as fully as we can is allowing ourselves to energetically take up more space. And I have, I remember sitting once at the back of the room when another speaker was speaking and she was using the same lavalier microphone that other speakers had used all day long. But she was talking really mumbly and super, super, super fast. And people came running back to me and they were like, what is going on? Is it the microphone? Like they just switched microphones and we still can't hear her and she has a microphone right there. And I was like, well, it's like she doesn't want to include everyone subconsciously and she doesn't really want to be seen or she's not at peace yet being seen. So the microphone is making her loud enough to be heard but her energy is not out holding all of us. And it, that garbled kind of, I'm not really here. It's like the signal has all this static in front of it when I'm listening to it, instead of coming out with this clear, you know, my soul is coming out and it's coming out crystal clear. And the sound of my voice hits the person I'm looking at and then kind of bounces all around the room to get the rest of the people. So the breath, you know, the body has to align to support the breath and then the breath supports the energy. And then we have to allow ourselves to be seen and really mean to include everybody. And it did shift when we all got on Zoom because everybody right now is you and you are a foot and a half away from my face. So what I started noticing is people who, if I went and stood at the back of my room here, they would just naturally innately project to where I was. And I started having to help some people be aware of the whole room, even though the person that you're talking to, if you're on Zoom or the people, it feels like you only need to send your energy or your voice a foot and a half. But at minimum, there's my foot and a half, and then there's a foot and a half beyond you. So I have to at least allow my voice to resonate and my energy to spread out that much. And it's a lot easier for people to, people become in, engaged with us where they're hanging on every word, the more we spread that energy out. Yeah. And what are, again, some, some little tips or take like practice things. What do you tell people to take home? What are things that, cause I feel um, a lot of how we talk is habit. I mean, it's kind of, you know, the interesting thing about being a speaker is that it's um, 
we have our casual talk and then we have, you know, performance or presentation talk. And I imagine like the way that you, your posture, the way you hold yourself, the way you can, you know, think about how your voice is coming out and relaxing your throat and your breath, um, you know, you can be kind of used to doing it one way. So what are, are there certain things you tell people like when you're st stepping up to the microphone and you're getting ready to speak, is there a way to hold yourself? Is there a best way to, you know, be at the optimal point to, to speak to an audience? Yeah, uh, I often will ask people to, to do a little warm up ahead of time. And something as simple as standing or sitting. So I'm standing right now, you're sitting. If I'm standing, it's feeling my feet and kind of rocking back and forth until I find the spot on my feet in my shoes today where I feel like everything can stack up on top of it with very little effort. And if you're seated, you do that on your sits bones. Your sits bones become your feet. And then a little check with the heart to ensure that it's open. So I'm not caving in the chest and like hiding my heart with my shoulders. And I'm not like becoming like a Shakespearean shield. It's kind of this balance of effort and ease. Almost like I'm breathing you in through my heart and sending myself out to you through my heart. Then come to the eyeballs and notice, am I making eye contact? And do I also have peripheral vision? If we're doing that, our energy is probably starting to spread out to things like the plant that's over here next to me because I'm aware it's there as opposed to if I'm looking at you like that. And then to do a check of the whole body, looking for a balance of effort and ease and that I'm not like, hiding with some other kind of sneaky gesture and then to do some of the breathing that we did earlier and then the final thing is to expand those energetic arms out to the edges of the space and in order to find that before we ever get to the warm-up I'll also often give people a homework or a life work assignment now that we can again go out and have coffee or tea in a cafe and notice that in a cafe, we will deeply connect with the person across from us, but we actually exclude everybody else because we're trying not to disturb their conversation. When we're on a stage, we wanna do the opposite of what we do in a cafe. So I wanna deeply connect still but I want my energy to do the opposite of what it's gonna do in a cafe. And then people sort of know it and they can go through this checklist of line up my body, do my breathing, expand my energy, connect to my intention, and then look and listen to the audience for signs of that change that I want for the world happening right now in little bits and pieces right in front of my eyes. So a few of the things you just mentioned, what was kind of coming to mind, I was just visualizing, you know, opening your, your chest, your heart and speaking, you know, I think of the, the chakra system, right? Mm -hmm. Is that something you focus on at all? Because I mean, when you think about it, when you are, you know, speaking as an energetic connection, you are just like you said, you're spreading out your energetic arms to reach out to people and to, you know, your, your heart speaks to their heart, you know, your throat speaks to them. And so you know, we always want to have our, our chakras open rather than blocked, but it sounds mm -hmm. like, especially I'm seeing like the heart chakra and your throat chakra, but even your solar plex, which is all about like that stern, like that's your, you know, you also, uh, a key thing you talk about is the primal life force, which in all of mm -hmm. is, which is in all of us. And that is what we're looking to come out when we really become, you know, a powerful presenter and speaker and leader. So is that something that you, that you've worked on personally or that you help people with is like, how do we unlock these chakras and think of these energy systems that we have that are at our disposal to use? Yeah, I, I do work with people with chakras and with um, energy systems from yoga. And I was kind of doing that intuitively before I had ever heard of a long time ago, before I started this business, when I would help other actors and work as a director. And then when I started doing this as a business, I intuitively felt called one year to go get a yoga teacher training. And it's still part intuitive and yet more informed by things that I've studied. And it's sort of like 
I will experience a place that a person is blocked hmm. either because I see it's like physical and energetic or because I start feeling something happening over here in me. Um, I'm an empath, so I often will feel energetically or emotionally what others are feeling. And then I'll just get curious and ask, what's happening in your throat right now? What are you sensing? And let them and their experience lead with my curiosity. Well, what would happen if you did this instead? Uh, what does your throat want to say? What is your heart? want right now um, and heart and throat I'm very aware of I know I'm also tapped into the root chakra mm -hmm. because I have a I have a drawing for my method and the phrase that I use is rooting in a sense of purpose and when I worked with some people to come up with the image I said I know a lot of other people talk about speaking from inspiration and they point up and it's not as if that is not there. I have just seen far too many speakers kind of look floaty and ungrounded and I wanna get them in the earth. So I wanna say root in a sense of purpose and they drew roots and I loved it. And then learned more about yoga. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you've got your root. And then you are also able to access the wisdom of the universe coming through you because you have that root. So you can take it in and do whatever you want with it instead of feeling like you got swept away in a hurricane or a tornado of energy. Yes. Yes. Wow. That makes me think of so many things, two big ones. So I actually just had a conversation with another woman who's, who's going to be on my show. And we were talking about, you know, personal evolution and how it kind of, we go in cycles and circles, but we're ever evolving up. Right. So I said that I was like, yeah, you know, we're, we face sometimes face the same, same challenges, but at least each time we're growing. And she said, yeah, but you know, I think of it as actually spiraling down because we're going into a rut. And I was like, okay, I hear you. Like, I get that we're because we're rooting ourselves. Like the more that we grow, the more that we're establishing you know, our deep roots of who we are and what, you know, our energy. And so that yeah. really, I like that. And, you know, I, I also, it's such a huge thing because, you know, a big part of women waken is the idea of the divine feminine energy, which is all about restoring the balance, harmony, and rooting and grounding of humanity where, you yeah. know, because so much of what we do is spiraling upward towards achievement and, you know, what heights can we reach with what we can do, but we've forgotten about, well, but what's holding us down? What are we, what are we connected with? What's keeping yeah. us at our base, at our soul, you know, ground rooted so that we can grow in a healthy, productive way, rather than just in a sort of, like you said, you're just, you're disconnected and suddenly it kind of, lo you lose your way. If, if you, if you grow too much without roots, you're going to fall over. You need them. Yeah. Yeah, it feels very primal, very organic. Yeah. And, you know, just like you said, if a tree didn't have roots, it would fall over. It wouldn't keep growing upward. It's the roots down that allow the tree to grow up. Yeah. And, and that's um, a big reason why I, you know, started Women Waken and why I started this podcast is because, you know, we're reaching a point where we we feel that we're able to work without rooting ourselves because we're like oh we'll just keep going this way you know it's we're, we're good we're doing so much we'll just but the reality is that just like you said it we it will things will fall eventually you can't be without roots and so and i think that more and more people are getting that sense of the divine feminine which is those who are feeling called to do the rooting work that are bringing us back to the earth to the ground to our primal instincts and who we are so that we can begin to have these deeper systems so that what we do is more meaningful and rooted, which always brings a sense of peace. I mean, without stability, you're always at a sense of dis disrest, right? Unrest. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of myself as a leader, I feel the, the temptation and the suck to go into that ultra masculine, go, 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 or have yeah. battled it over the years and every time I actually reroute and allow myself to receive where to go next that's my theme for the year by the way receive Ooh. um 
I've told people it's like, I will slingshot from that receive, reground, reroute into action and almost don't realize it's happening because it's not a thing my head decided to do. Mm-hmm. And it's like you said, so much more effortless and so much more powerful. And it's almost like it, it energetically feels like it brought those feminine earth roots with it into the action. Yeah. Yeah, that, that seems to be exactly what's occurring. And also I feel, you know, just as you said, where you said you just kind of inherently started doing work that you later found was sort of based in yoga practices and chakra practices, but it just kind of came to you. And I feel, you know, those things are coming to a lot of us just seemingly out of nowhere. Like I remember feeling, why do I feel so called to, to speak to women and to connect with other women and talk about like what, what we're actually feeling and what's important to us and what we have to offer that's, you know, sort of unique in that feminine energy. And I didn't know it just, and things like that, like roots and, and harmony and balance just kept coming. I was like, there's something here that's really important. We need to, we got yeah. to look at this. And it, you know, it's such an interesting thing to think about because, you know, it's, a, it's our soul, but it's also more of a collective soul type thing. I think that's bringing us to this. It could, it's ancestral. It's so many things that are, I believe are trying to kind of work with us and guide us right now to create a life on earth that is truly beautiful and harmonic. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I couldn't agree more. My my image of harmony is, or one of them, is that it's like humanity is like a huge orchestra with 7.8 billion people. And up until now, some of the instruments have not been playing the people who haven't been speaking up. So other instruments have been trying to play harder, but a drum is a drum and a violin is a violin. And in order to have a beautiful orchestra, we need both to be playing full out. And global harmony is when every person on the planet is playing full out from their soul, not playing full out ego, really playing full out from their soul. And there's a way that that includes listening to the other instruments and in full out. And I've got my peripheral vision. I'm listening to how you're playing. We can evolve and reach harmony together, every voice in the conversation. Yes, so much. Yes, because, you know, I. I think we are very much stuck in a, in that ego state where it's not about playing in that gorgeous orchestra that plays together, but it's about, well, I need to, I want to be heard. I want to stand out. I want to, and not that there's, but to your point, when we all play, we all do stand out because no one is quite playing just like us. And I yeah. had the same vision where, you know, whether it's like a, to me, it's like a mosaic where every single little piece, you know, has its own unique um, essence and light and color that it brings to this larger picture. When you see the whole picture, it's, oh my gosh, we need everybody here. The whole, yeah. you know, all the billions of people on the planet. But when I, I love the orchestra um, analogy, because it's this unique sound that's created by every single person. And I think what we see is that people don't believe they have a sound. They don't believe they have something to offer. They're not a part of the orchestra. So they kind of step back. And like you said, then the others kind of come in and it sounds like they're the ones that are most important. And it just creates, again, this imbalance and this lack and of disharmony and a disharmony. Yeah. yeah. And when I've had those visions, I also see that there's, you know, along with people who play the instruments, there's conductors, there's people that part of their job is to help all the different, you know, sections play together. And, you know, it sounds like that might be a bit of your work where you're able to see like, you know, Hey, this is what you've got going on and let me help you bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. And let everybody be their own dot in the greater picture. That's part of what I love is it's not, it's not about everybody trying to speak like the current most popular speaker. Speak like them. them. Everybody has their own presence or their own charisma and you can't find it by trying to imitate Tony Robbins. Yeah. Yeah. Tony Robbins is the only Tony Robbins. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is the only Oprah Winfrey. 
Yeah. I'm the only Lori Smith. You're the only Whitney Walker. And we need each of us to be ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, I, I just have such a strong feeling that that's just the eventual state of things that we can only keep up this, you know, discord of, of music and playing. Cause it's, it's not the symphony doesn't sound that great right now. You know, it's, it's, it's out of that. It's not that beautiful soul sound as you spoke to, because when we all move from ego into our soul, that's when the real authentic sound comes out and it's going to like probably the most beautiful thing you could ever hear <laughs> it's a whole yeah. in a world of people playing to their soul's music um which may sound really out there but I, I just think that that's it's as as much as we normalize the way things are now I think that eventually we're going to see that that's actually much more it's not idealized it's actually much more you know realistic to be playing in a way where everyone isn't trying to push or exert or force something they're just naturally expressing because then we're more at peace and then we're peacefully yeah. playing together and we're not looking around saying, oh my gosh, these sound so good. And I wish I could do that. We're, we're all focusing on ourselves. Each person, yeah. I'm just, I'm doing my thing and I'm so grateful for everyone around me. Like what a different world that would be. We don't know that as a world, we've never experienced that. Not in the thousands of years of civilization, I, you know, competition started very early. And the yeah. idea that some people are magnificent and others aren't is very much ingrained in us. Yeah. Yeah. What a cost to that. huh? Yeah. It's huge. It's detrimental. You know, I work in addiction and, and substance abuse and recovery. And, you know, so much of that is that the crux of any addiction is you, you don't know what to do with yourself and your energy and the pain that you felt. So you seek things outside of you to feel better because you feel I have nothing. I'm empty. You know, I've got the message that I'm not worthy. I'll never be, I'm not lovable. So I need to find something. And if we, if that messaging shifted, I believe everything would change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. If we could find, you know, our own primal life force from an early age and recognize like, Ooh, what, what do I got? What have I got going on? If we're taught like, you know, that you have something to bring to the table, that's only you can do that's so needed in the whole orchestra. Yeah. I think that that's going to be very incredible and yeah. what you're doing is helping people to find that and it's so <laughs> yes and I love it I love it yeah and how cool that you found your life work and you're enjoying it and thriving you know that's the hope for everybody is that we find we align with our soul's calling in this life our soul's purpose yeah yeah absolutely so wonderful and then so you also talk I mean you talk a lot about leadership and then you talk about um charismatic speaking can you tell us about that if we get back to okay I think I'm ready to find my voice you know to your point we look at sort of the more prominent figures like okay maybe like you know a, a president or you know a um motivational speaker and we say well how do how did they learn to speak so in a way that feels so easy to receive and you know pleasing yeah the I have to I have to give you my metaphor we're, we're, we're all trained to show up like this so if I'm sitting here doing this version of me looking at Barack Obama trying to imitate Barack Obama I'm never going to unleash my charisma mm -hmm. what actually needs to happen is to release the resistance in the body the breath and the energy that's the primal part to kind of get the primal flowing back to what we had when we were babies up to maybe four or five years old and then you know when we're four or five years old my mom said no you can't have any more halloween candy and i threw this really vibrant primal temper tantrum Me too. Supermarket. yeah and everyone <laughs> heard me that's primal by itself and then primal life force connected to purpose as wise adults is when we start to unleash this version. And it's still ringing. I can stop it, but that's the resonance and the charisma that we all have. It's about removing the stories, the physical patterns, the beliefs, releasing all of that or because I like you know I like to be honest with with my clients and with people who might be listening 
in my experience, it's not that the inner critic and the ego, they don't go away. We just learn how to put our soul self in the driver's seat. So my ego might be over there going, are you sure you picked the right word? Are you sure you're wearing the right outfit? <laughs> Thank you for your help. <laughs> you know, I do want to wear an outfit and it's not what's most important to my soul self. If I'm wearing the wrong outfit, if I spilled coffee on myself right before I step up on a stage, at this point in my life, partially because I would be modeling what I want for others, I could have coffee all down the front of my shirt and I would just get on stage and work it in because I believe I'm modeling. It's not about the coffee. It's about the resonance of the voice. So let's all have a moment, look at the coffee that I spilled on myself, and then let's get to the work of changing the planet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's one of the hardest things, I think, is to let go of those or remove those blocks. And, you know, obviously I know a lot of that as a, a therapist, any healer knows that that's, that's our work is to help people, you know, to me, it's kind of like uncovering that core of ourselves, that brilliant core that we're talking about that exists within us. And we're learning, we're trying to learn how to first identify what's covering it and then uncover it and then let it come forth through our voice, through our actions, through our expressed feelings and emotions and all of that. But it, it can be hard because, you know, the work is unique because you're only doing it for you. You know, this world will give you a lot of messages about trying to be impressive and, you know, look a certain way and be materialistically appealing, but it's very little motivation to say, hey, connect with who you are to be your optimal internal self, to really appreciate that. That's one person and it's you. And you're the only person that can decide to make that choice and focus on that. And that's why it can be such a battle because it feels like, well, but there's so many rewards from getting external, you know, achievements and acknowledgement, but the only thing from this is an internal peace, but the reality is that that's the best thing in the world is to yeah. find a little bit of peace inside and acceptance of ourselves. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot richer. Yes. Um, it's a lot more rich and deep and full. And that's why people like yourself and coaches like me, part of why we exist is so that when someone is doing that soul work, in some ways they are alone, because they've got televisions telling them that they need the latest beauty products. And then they have you going, yes, and come home to yourself. And me going, yes, there's an ad saying that we need to lose 40 pounds and come home to your soul. What weight does your soul want you to be or whatever you know, version of that? Like, do you need the biggest house? What house does your soul want to live in? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, maybe for you or I, those are concepts that we've learned to consider on a daily basis and consistently work towards. But I imagine a lot of people who work with you and people I've worked with is they've never really thought about that. Well, what do you mean? What does my soul want? What is, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to connect with my soul. I don't even know, you know, how to conceive of that. And so that can be such a big switch and yeah. transformation for people. Yeah, and I don't know about you, I wouldn't have gotten here if I didn't have some people like my own coach 15 years ago, great teachers along the course of my life, even starting when I was you know, younger, weaving in, in the middle of our educational system, I was fortunate to have some teachers that were doing their part to go, I'm teaching you math, and I'm also going to try to help you find yourself along the way so there are supports out there if we go if we take what they're giving us and we seek them out and then start to surround ourselves with friends coaches therapists yoga classes you know surround ourselves with people that speak this language all the time so that we're, we're alone in our journey and we're not alone in our journey because we might be around people within the greater world that's still the vast majority is, is more about external validation. Mm -hmm. But if we can surround ourselves with some people that are more supportive of that, it makes it a little bit easier and more fun to have people with us on our own journey while they're living theirs. 
Definitely, definitely. And, you know, it's about building community, right? Building your community of people that you resonate with, that you all, that you, you know, you feel akin to aligned with, you know, at an energetic level, vibrating at the same frequency, you know, it's yeah. like, I, I feel you, we're vibing, yeah. you know, and we're, then vibing. I, we're vibing, I'm vibing with you, you know, we're vibing, we're feeling it. And I feel, I feel because, you know, the way that we're able to speak and, you know, discourse with one another is because we both are kind of thinking and feeling similar things. And I think that that's, you know, it's so important to connect with people because that's where big things happen is when a lot of different people who are all kind of, you know, experiencing and feeling the similar things can come together and work together and build something great. Yeah. So that's, that's my goal. My work is to more and more move towards establishing community. You know, that's a big reason I do this podcast is I've had the most amazing guests and I stay in touch with a lot of them. And I want to find more ways to, it's like, I want you guys to all hang out in a big room together. I want us to all be like, you know, we'd solve the world problems together. I feel like we'd make some serious magic. And I, I believe that one day I can move more towards that because I think that's, what's going to be needed to really make these, these shifts happen. And for all of us to really pop off in our, you know, our true primal life force is when we're, you know, when we're, we move further away from that energy, that's sort of very external and ego based and more into the soul. Then I think those things kind of drift away more. Yeah. Whereas when you're right in it, it feels like this constant battle to not be preoccupied with material things with, you know, validation and, and all of that, that comes with fixation on external. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm so grateful for people like you that are doing the work that you're doing, I'm excited to work with you. I plan to, cause I'm ready to hone my voice and really fine tune it and be ready to step forward and speak more. I'm very excited by that. <laughs> and I'm so glad you drew me to you because uh, I love talking with you. I love vibing with you. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. So Lori, oh, one more thing, another, because you're offering some great takeaways and everybody loves takeaways. Leadership. And you talk about visionary leadership must-haves. So what can you leave us with when someone's thinking about, you know, I keep thinking about these things. This is, this seems like an important message, but what are the must-haves for being a visionary leader? What are the things that I can start thinking about that I want to incorporate and start, you know, putting, raising in my, my value system? What can I be focusing on to be that visionary leader that I would like to be? Yeah. It's, it's like a three-legged stool. One of the legs is the ability to communicate in an engaging, inspirational, alive, primal life force way. The second leg is a vision of a better future or the something that our soul is called here to do. And the third one is the ability to be in the present moment. All three of those things help a visionary leader make their vision real on this planet. Beautiful, beautiful. That's a great vision. And three things to kind of be checking in with, because you can do those, you can check in with those throughout the day. Am I present? And is my, you know, am I fixated on something that happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow? Or am I, because there's something very, you know, when I'm in the present moment, I feel very strong. You know, there's something about it that's very noble when you say, I'm going to be right here with this person that's with me, with this moment that I'm within. You know, I, I tend to feel, you know, the term inner child is, is popular with therapists and I love that kind of work. It's very healing. And it's our, it's the inner child in me that kind of chirps up when I'm wanting to think about the past and say like, well, was that okay that happened? Do I need to, should I be worried about that? And well, what's going to happen down the line? And this, you know, questioning myself, but when you're in the yeah. moment, you're really, it's, you're kind of honoring life enough yeah. to be there for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those are such wonderful points um, and very helpful. So Lori, if people want to work with you and find more, out more about you and what you do, how can they find you? Do you have any offerings right now? Do you have any programs going on? Like what, what you got for us? I do. Uh, they can go to my website, which I think you have the link for. It's www.voice-matters.com. And I'm going to be kicking off my compelling speaker, Master the Art of Presence program, which is my favorite way to work with people who are visionaries speaking for the sake of a mission. Uh, the next one launches in March. I don't know when this is going to air. Uh, there's 
most likely going to be another fast track one during the summer. And the next round is in March. When in March does it start? First week of March. Okay. Well, this will air in about like a week or two. So then that'll be time for people to sign up. Awesome. Fantastic. Cool. Well, all of those links will be in the show notes so people can check you out and work with you through that. And Lori, this has been so fun. Yes, it has. Thank you so much for having me. You are so welcome. Thank you for being here. And I'd love to have you back because this is such a great thing to reconnect with, you know, reconnecting with, you know, it's because it, it truly is a tool as we talked about that we're honing is your voice is your presence. And it's so important to reconnect back to it because you can drift from it. Right. When yeah. we get caught up in the milieu and all of the things that happen in life, get back to that stool and the, the roots, right. Building those roots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, Lori, we'll take care. Thanks again. Thanks. You too.